But I want to start, um, if you would just like to maybe talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing together and, and seeing and, and just go ahead and, and kind of introduce the, the theme of the work you're trying to do here. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the theme is, 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 is very clear. We all know that climate change is very real. We all know that our planet is in incredible danger. And we really think a lot about how do we fix that? And when it comes down to it, most of the biggest changes ever, most of the biggest revolutions that have ever taken place have been from people on the ground, right? Governments can do work, corporations can do work, but it's people and consumers that bring about fundamental change. So we're really in, 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 in the space of like, how do you inspire people to bring about that change? Max? Yeah, ab absolutely, uh, Yusuf. And a lot of... Uh, I guess at, at its core, uh, what we, we're trying to do is build a connection, use technology in a way that builds a connection between uh, people uh, and that and their environment, and, and getting them to understand really what they're they're part of and how valuable and special um, that is. Yeah, um, could you maybe talk, so what, what kind of inspired you to, to kind of approach things uh, using AI? It's, uh, it's funny, so many great innovations often start with play and with games and with just having fun. Uh, and Max was actually out on a little adventure uh, in South Africa. He'd been invited um, to do some sort of a, a physical quest, and, and that really gave birth to this idea. Uh, Max? Yeah, um, so, you know, it was probably a couple of factors, that being one. So it was um, my wife who organised, you know, uh, basically like a quest through a, a very beautiful beach and forest part of South Africa. And it was around the same time, and this was during 2020, when, when obviously COVID was, was, you know, having a huge impact around the world, that, you know, I was coming, or Yusuf and I were both, uh, looking at how important environmental issues are globally and, and nationally, but taking that exam, uh, you know, that specific event, uh, my wife and I did this amazing fun uh, quest in nature where someone uh, actually hid little clues and we had to sort of race around the forest and dig up, uh, you know, uh, sort of like a little treasure chest uh, on the beach and have... Um, and we had this great time and another sort of event at the same time was I was doing a lot of uh, personal, just spending lots of time in nature um, and and these sort of things clicked in a way and made gave me this realisation that there's so many amazing stories and opportunities for engagement in our natural environment that perhaps AR is going to be this amazing platform for um, that allows us to to really highlight. Okay, this is really special, and and, and this is fun. If if people think about, um, I don't know their childhoods and childhoods are different nowadays. But just going with your friends and and running around the woods or running around your neighbourhood lakes and uh, you know just spending time in nature. That that's really at a, at its core what we're trying uh, to get people to do. Uh, with with obviously the the bigger picture being like spending time in, in nature by connecting with these environments um, they're going to understand and, and better protect them Rog, and, and just on that on that game that max had played like he basically had a, a tour guide in south africa that went around a forest and left like physical notes and physical treasures all over the place like a like a like a like a scavenger hunt that he had to go and find and that got him to these forests, that got him to these lakes, that got him to these, these places. And they were just like, how do you do that? How do you get people to travel around nature without physically having to leave clues, without having like to walk around and drop off all these clues that they have to find? Which one is not so environmentally sound, right? Because you have to end up like littering all these things. And two, is really difficult to scale. Like if I wanted to make a game that you can play in Los Angeles and I can play in Australia and somebody else can play in South Africa, I can't be running around leaving physical treats um, so that was like the real inspiration moment. We were like, cool, let's make environmental games that have the same ethos, but AR is perfectly su suited for leaving games, leaving treasures across natural environments without leaving any 
the kind of environmental footprint. Yeah, that, that sounds incredible. It's such a unique use um, of the technology. I, I want to dive a little bit. Um, I want to start by getting a little bit more into the science of it. And I, I kind of wanted to ask you, Max, like, what impact do you feel like the agriculture, like agriculture has on the environment as kind of a whole? Obviously, you know, just looking at the, the big picture, agriculture has a huge impact uh, on the environment. And uh, sometimes that, you know, that is a really bad impact. But the, the caveat is that agriculture as an industry is where there's the greatest or where there's some of the greatest potential for positive change, you know, and, and the, the, the amount of the world's land area, it's about 40% of the, the world's land area is used for agriculture. So I think if agriculture is done badly, you know, think of, think of the consequences, but when agriculture is done well, um, then it's also a fantastic opportunity. And 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 just to just to say, it, I, I've seen both, and and I've seen a lot of uh, innovation and amazing things that farmers have been already doing and have been doing for many years. And and that's uh, at a deeper level what we're also trying to connect to is to 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 provide a, a community that supports uh, sustainability. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important part about this application um, is you're getting a lot of users who are kind of being enticed by the game and, and you're getting them to kind of engage with topics that they may not otherwise understand. Um, how, how practically, as you've been testing this and using this, how has that felt? How do you, what are the responses you're getting from this? Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're thinking about AR in two ways. One is about, as you correctly described, creating games in natural environments that gets people out to play games and then eventually capture data, take pictures of their local water sources, rivers, lakes, take pictures of their local trees, leaves, uh, and be able to submit that data by basically sending direct messaging or inboxing Albert and being like, hey, Albert, here's uh, this data that I captured. And Thanks to the Snapchat camera and all the metadata that's baked into, uh, you know, some of the images that we capture, we're able to grab the username, we're able to grab a temperature, we're able to get, gather the location, we're able to have all these kinds of signals, um, which are incredibly useful, right? Environmentalists, ecologists, conservationists, they desperately need real-time data to understand what's happening in our environment, what's going right, what's going wrong. And the previous way of doing that, which you know, Max, through a lot of his career has been involved in, is, is quite labor intensive and, and, and expensive and, and, and quite boring. Um, so in answer to your question of, of, of results, we've been really excited. We've been really excited to see citizens from all over the world, from here in Australia, from South Africa, from the UK, uh, from the US, who have been able to submit these, these images, sometimes from national parks, sometimes from their local uh, park just down the road from their house. Um, and that's really, really exciting. It's a really good first signal um, in terms of really being able to create what, what we're calling citizen scientists. Um, yeah, I mean that's such an amazing concept. And I'm dropping, I'm dropping a link in Twitter uh, into the chat right now, the, the Twitter post where we both announced this, where there's some really great video of of the game itself. So anyone in the audience can kind of get a sense of that and get a feeling for it. Um, and not to mention that uh, there are lens links themselves that are already available. Um, tell me a little bit about where you see this going in terms of like how AR can grow as a tool and how that can maybe uh, grow into using it for these kinds of citizen scientists, as you kind of talked about. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's two really exciting opportunities when we think about augmented reality and the environment. One of them is what we call bringing new users to Mother Nature. Like, unfortunately, in our big kind of modern world, we've become totally disconnected from the natural spaces around us. And if you don't really appreciate those spaces and understand why they're so amazing, you've really got no incentive to um, kind of get into conservation. Uh, we really think appreciation is the first step to conservation. And even more so, if, if you don't get out into national environments, 
you're not going to miss them when they're gone. Um, one of the really great uh, kind of historical factors here is here in Australia, there's amazing Aboriginal stories about natural environments. In the US, there's incredible uh, Native American stories about environments. And I think Western culture is kind of realizing over time the incredible um, logic and the incredible kind of um, techniques for preserving the environment that were baked into some of those stories. Um, for example, here in Australia, Aboriginal Australians for many, many years have been, have been uh, promoting the idea of, of, of controlled fires uh, to help prevent wildfires. Um, those stories exist. Now, how do you tell those stories? They historically lived, you know, in many ways and cave paintings and all kinds of things. What if you can take these age-old stories, these incredible wisdoms, and overlay them onto our natural environments using AR? That's a really exciting idea. So that's the first thing, is like using AR to take incredible environmental historical lessons from indigenous communities and overlay them onto our environments so that we can access them, play with them, access them in new ways, and through that process, access data, and then eventually use AR scavenger hunt type games to navigate you to sustainable products and services. So you've played the game, you've captured the data, and then you head off to the local ice cream shop and you go and buy Albert's ice cream made with you know organic milk, or you head off and, and, and you, you find all these, you go to a little clothing store and buy something that's made of uh, a sustainable material. The other interesting opportunity in AR that we're really, really passionate about, and listen carefully, everyone, because this one's a little bit more complex, if you are getting your users to capture data in natural environments, right? They, they, they're capturing uh, what their local forests look like. That data also shows us what types of plants natively grow in that area. We end up getting that information. And if we can serve that information to local farmers, local food producers, it can help inform the decision making that they make when they are actually cultivating the land. So at the moment, we're thinking about AR around part as a gaming tool, but the longer term vision is actually around land management and whether we can create AR tools for farmers too, so that they can open up their camera and overlay onto national environments. Oh, wow, this is what it would look like if I was growing a local crop and, and this is how much space that I would require and this is how much water I would require. Um, and that's a game changing idea because especially when you look around the world at farming communities in India, in, on the African continent, many are, are illiterate. They can't read and write. And, and that makes it really difficult to access information on the internet. AR completely democratizes that. AR really opens up the idea of like, wow, the internet doesn't require a reading and writing or, the, or a query keyboard anymore. It just requires a camera. And a farmer anywhere in the world can point their, their, their camera at the land and see the quality of the soil, point their camera at the sky and see what the weather's going to look like point their, their, their camera at their field and see what a new crop might look like. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's two totally separate AR directions that we're moving in. One of them is games, which lead to data capture, which leads to retail. The other one is land management and farmers being able to look at land and, and see what they're doing. But it's just like mind blowing when you think about the possibilities of augmented reality and, and the way it democratizes these two very, very different fields. Yeah. That's that's incredible insight. I think that there's so many interesting directions here. You know, one thing that's really fascinating here is is Yusuf, you and and you know characterize your background however you want to, but you come from a storytelling background. You spent time as a journalist and and then a lot of really cool, interesting things. And Max, you obviously work in science. I'm curious what that collaboration was like. And in, in, in many ways, did you guys learn from each other um, anything about how you can do your own work in new ways? Max, I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I'm always learning every time I'm with you, Seth. Um, and I think you, you touched on it. We're, we're very different, but we're, we're all, I, mean, I don't know if the, the audience knew this or you knew this. We're also very good friends. So, so we, we came to this project together uh, as actual really, really close friends. If I if I sort of look at our collaboration, um, the the two the, there's sort of a couple of things that that stand out, which I think uh, you know I really appreciate. One is you know Yusuf brings this really good understanding of 
as you said, storytelling, audience, uh, as his background, you know, would 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 suggest. And I sort of come at it, okay, obviously bringing some of the science, uh, bringing some of that ecological aspect. And it, it often works where I say, okay, Yusuf, you know, I think this uh, has to happen. And this is a story about how trees grow in this area and the amount of water and the weather conditions. And I think it's really good and I'll weave in like wizards and, and all this. Um, and then, you know, Yusuf and I will come back and we'll work together and say, okay, look, it needs to be, sh you know, it needs to be a little bit short or it needs to be more punchy. So it's a really awesome collaboration because we both have this shared appreciation of wanting part, wanting this to be a, a, a very um, special product that, that, you know, does link people to the environment. But those almost contrasting or, or uh, different perspectives, I think, sharpen what we, we end up putting together. Um, so, yeah, and you said, yeah, jump in and add if you Yeah. Office. I mean, I think everybody loves a good story rug, but they, they love it, especially if they can be a part of that story. And, and that's the differentiator with AR. It's not passive lean back consumption. It's actively involved in that story, that adventure, that narrative. Um, both Max and I have been really fortunate to have to, to have recently started families as well. We've both just had kids that are really young and I think we find ourselves increasingly taking our, our young kids into nature and you're constantly looking around and you're like, Ooh, doesn't that tree look like a wizard? Oh, doesn't that look like a, a, a demon? And you know, you're building out these stories and, and, and it's just like, wow, AR actually allows you to bring those stories to life in, in really, really cool ways. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just such a, um, a cool way uh, to go about this work. I, you know, I think we're going to get into some technical stuff in a bit, and I, I want to, but I also, I just kind of want to ask, go back to storytelling, and and given that, you know, a lot of people who approach AR right now, they're, they're approaching it from a way that feels um, like it's at the beginnings of how to connect to our world. We're starting to experiment with a lot of concepts. This is something that's very like next level. It's very much involving multiple disciplines. It's involving a lot of um, real like involvement in making the user feel like they're part of the story. How did you develop that kind of sense, Yusuf? And, and what kinds of maybe creations did you do till you kind of learned enough to kind of attack something like this? Yeah, thank you so much. I think when you think about augmented reality <laughs> and the future of storytelling as a whole, as we kind of approach, you know, 2030, I mean, we're all really building towards this, right? We're building towards, like, it. part is fun on a phone, but it's going to get really fun when we start to wear it, when we start to look out at the world and, and, and see these stories. When, you, when we start to build towards that future, if we can all agree that, okay, by 2030, we're all going to be wearing some form of wearable on our face and, like, the camera is going to become the primary input to technology, there is so many different building blocks that you have to build along the way um, to kind of realize that future. It's, it, it's, it's a little bit like um, if you're designing uh, uh, um, train tracks, you don't build trains to where people, or train tracks to where people used to live yesterday, or you don't leave build train tracks to where they live today, you, you build train tracks to where people are going to live tomorrow. And it's the same thing when you're creating the kind of infrastructure and skills for a project like this, you really have to build lots of infrastructural blocks or train, uh, train tracks to, to where people are going. So there is tons of disciplines. Like I think the biggest one that we're still trying to figure out and, and master is game mechanics. Game mechanics of like, how do you make games entertaining? One of the most difficult things about this whole project has been what we've realized that most people really only go to three places in their lives on a regular basis. They, they, they go to work, they go home, and they do one other thing. Go work, home, gym. Work, home, uh, church. Work, home, um, whatever the gaming, whatever the third thing is. And now we're like, oh, actually, we want you to go to a park. We want to go to out to. So you've got to make a game that's, that's hellishly fun, right? And, and if at any point in, in, in that AR experience, it gets frustrating. It takes too long to load. You get confused. It is so quick to just put your phone into your pocket and say, like, game over. Um, 
So I think that's one of the biggest things is, is, is game mechanics. I think then character development is another big one. Like the, when you think about pro, like IP, like, like Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go is a really interesting product, but it also had lovable characters that we all knew. We all knew Pikachu and we all knew these Pokemon. So developing Albert, who's our central kind of koala bear out as, as a character is really important that you have a strong narrative. So strong game mechanics is important. Strong character development and narrative is important. Um, then there's like kind of the, the, the data capture side of things. Like how do you get people to actually take pictures of natural environments? How do you make that fun and safe, et cetera? Um, there's so many different moving parts. Um, and my suggestion is you can actually build out smaller games and smaller experiences that help you master each of those disciplines. We did a project with Snapchat in Boston um, where you rock spectacles and you could see history overlaid onto the city. And that really helped us understand space time and how to get people to navigate to certain spaces. Uh, we did another project where when my wife was pregnant, we overlaid uh, fetal developments of the baby onto her body. And that really helped us understand 3D modeling and that kind of space. So I think when you approach, a, it, you know, um, as, as a saying, how do you eat an elephant? You, you start in small pieces or, or something along those lines. Um, it's the same thing. If, if you're going for these kind of big, uh, endeavor, you, you start by building much smaller lenses that address specific challenges that you're trying to uh, build. Incredible. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about these specific lenses? What were some like challenges, uh, both technical and just like specifically, um, you know, regarding the content of these lenses that either of you kind of had as you were kind of constructing them? Yeah, I mean, I think most of that, that came down to Max. In fact, uh, Max, if you'll speak to some of the, the narrative around some of the, the games. I mean, I, I particularly love uh, Albert going up and looking for the honey, but I mean, also uh, cleaning up the rivers. Yeah, uh, well, I guess from, from my perspective, a lot of it was obviously having this, uh, you know, really amazing game idea and, and rec recognizing there are, there are limits to technology. So in terms of the memory, in terms of the functionality that that you know the really good people we work with can can produce, and also making sure, uh, and this is an important point for us. We, we're we're really uh, aware that the last thing we want is to have people going into nature and 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 spending. You know, if I hold my phone up, we we don't want people just being in nature but sort of looking at their phone. So it's having that blend. Uh, that balance of okay, we, we 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 know that technology exists and we know people use it, but making sure that the games still get people to actually immerse themselves in their environment and still focus predominantly mostly on getting them to to look around, to to look for particular trees, to look for a water source. But then it's where that crafting comes in and saying, okay, how can we take a, a tree? Um, and make it sort of fun, make it engaging, and that's where we had this idea of, you know, Albert being a, a koala, and everyone uh, probably knows that iconic Australian, you know, boomerang and fetching honey and throwing honey. So again, that was just an example of a process where, okay, something that that we can have that's still quite engaging, but it's not completely removing. Um, so a big part is, is getting that balance right in terms of. Uh, a gameplay that it's within that environment and doesn't doesn't uh, necessarily over overtake it. Um, and and from a you know I'm not a game developer myself or don't have those technical skills. So uh, and it's actually a really challenging but at the end a very rewarding process where uh, you know Yusuf and I might work with them and we have the raw product and then it gets sort of banged on the head a little bit, it, you know, you can't do that memories too much or you can do that and then it, it sort of moves forward uh, gradually. I think for the most part, as always, we're just really trying to take inspiration from, from nature itself. Um, we're trying to anchor the games in natural environments. So one of my favorite parts of the quest is where you go to your local river, you scan it, and then you pop open into a game where you're surrounded by plastic waste and you're surrounded by fish and you've got to kind of use this little uh, spear gun or this little spear to grab the plastic waste and, and obviously avoid the fish. Um, 
there's another really cool game where uh, you, you you take a, a leaf and you scan it and it tells you a little story. You place the leaf down and an augmented tree uh, erupts from the ground. And then Albert, you've got to navigate him up the tree. He's got to climb up the tree um, and try and access this honey, which has got, you know, uh, all these bees around it. And you uh, and, and the whole aim there is to get somebody to take a picture of, of their local forest or trees. Um, but Albert eventually grabs his honey, brings it down, and then you learn that koala bears don't eat honey. Um, but Albert's like, hey, you can you can still buy some sustainable honey and, and do your part to save the planet. Um, so I think weaving into those game mechanics a little bit of humor has been a really exciting uh, journey. Yeah, incredible. Um, you're going out into the world. You're asking users to kind of go out there. There's some really practical challenges of like cell signal and optimization. Uh, is that is that something that played into like the creation of this? And, and how did you guys all think about that? I think Snap uh, have done a really good job of, of forcing you to think about that in many respects. I think as a, as a lens community, like so many people on this call, we've historically had to build lenses in, you know, two megs or four megs or eight megs. And obviously that's now expanding as we, as we kind of think about the, the, the Snap cloud and, and access to uh, remote resources. But I think it has really built quite a resilient discipline of building small packages and being able to serve this up to people um, but it is something we think a lot about. I think the next stage uh, and evolution of this product is, is, is moving towards Snap Camera Kit. Um, we can only do so much with an individual lens. We can only tell a very specific story, whereas the reality is this is a quest. This is a journey through nature which takes you through three or four games, and Albert gives you little anecdotes along the way and guides you, and you're following his little koala footprints as you go. And... Camera Kit is the perfect place to house that as an uh, independent, like kind of iOS or Android app. But like, it, and and I think even more so is like I was really excited to Snap Partner Summit um, to hear about like Snap AR being on the web. And I think that there's a really really exciting future where somebody's going to be able to go online to a website and uh, open it up and and play the game because that just like opens up so many more potential users. It's so easy to to have a little QR code at a environmental location that somebody can scan and they open up into the browser and they're suddenly playing a game without even having to download an app. Um, that's a really exciting feature. So yeah, in answer to your question, I think Snap and, and Lens Studio has created a discipline of, of creating small uh, packages, but the ultimate aim would be uh, a camera kit uh, app, which could be used offline, uh, or um, web AR, which could be really broadly used. Amazing. Max, what, what's the response been in the, in the community for people who you might be interacting with in the scientific community that know nothing about AR? Um, and do, do they see the data, you know, being helpful in their, in their work? Yeah, abs absolutely. So uh, I, I'm not an ecologist myself. I, I come from the, the livestock background, but certainly I think Yusuf touched on it. This... Uh, particularly when we, we talk about data on the environment, uh, you know, and, and just to give an example, that could be the types of trees uh, that, you know, the, the, the um, characteristics of water, you know, is it polluted local rivers? That data has traditionally been very expensive and very time consuming to collect and, and recognising that there are a limited number of, of those people who go out. So the scale of being able to, to collect that data is, again, super limited. So the potential that, or when, you know, when we speak to, to obviously a lot of people in that area, there's a lot of excitement because the just the scale and the accessibility that, that an idea, you know, what we're working on can, can potentially provide uh, could be a massive bonus, and and of course, look, it, it has its limitations. We're not, we're not, you know, you can't say that someone playing an a augmented reality game is giving you the same quality of data as as an experienced uh, environmental scientist. But it comes back to what we said: it's getting users out in nature and just making observations and making connections. So when you bring all that data together from vastly different sources, uh, it has great potential, not only to see 
or not only for, for scientists to understand, okay, what are the impacts of climate change, but, but also things like we're not just dealing with climate change, we're dealing with biodiversity issues, we're dealing with pollution issues. And sometimes it's, it's also about seeing has an intervention worked? You know, if, if the government or if there's been a major effort in a particular area to address things, uh, maybe that that also is a uh, a night or not it's an important thing to see okay is this intervention working are certain bird species coming back are certain trees that were no longer in this area now present in this area so the potential for this data to be used uh, you know it's very exciting and, and a lot of the the people we've speaking to, spoken to um are really excited about it and 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 just to add you know citizen science as a concept as a field is very well established it's it's not you know yusuf and i'm suggesting this is a new thing but it's it's trying to sort of give it that shot in the arm or really just recapture uh, public imagination uh, almost like you know just think about what jurassic park did for for dinosaurs or or, or, or but yeah it's 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 really trying to to take it forward with this amazing new modality uh, that is augmented reality. Um, Rag, there was a particular, uh, something that happened recently that really got us excited. We uh, saw a news article here in Australia where the local governments are putting up these like, these like wooden boxes on the top of cliff edges, looking down at beaches, like a big wooden frame. And they are encouraging citizens to put their phone into the frame and take a picture from that point of view. So they're creating like a little frame and they're like, yo, if anybody's passing by here, can you please put your phone in this box and take a picture of this little view? Because we need to capture this coastline. We need to, we need to monitor it. We want to see what's happening with the tides and stuff like that. And that was like a huge aha moment for us. We were like, wow, like local Australian governments are actually trying to get citizens to take photos of various parts of the country because they're really battling to to understand what's happening in those spaces. How do we do that at a bigger scale? Incredible. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so clear that there's there's been so much kind of community development work that's kind of led up to this. I'm curious creatively, like just you as you both, like what inspires you creatively and, and what is there anything that any other AR experiences that have really kind of stuck out to you? I, I spoke about this at, at Snap Partner Summit. We did a little uh, breakaway panel and I said that, you know, my entire career has been built around the mobile phone, right? I, I was a foreign correspondent. I, I covered wars and, and natural disasters. I, I really saw the worst of humanity and the best, um, but I was often documenting it with my mobile phone. But I actually hate my phone. I find that I am not present at all. I, I hate the idea that like my interactions are typing down like this. And um, if I'm looking for directions, I'm looking down. And I, I, I think a lot of the creative inspiration uh, that both of us have is, is that we actually don't like uh, the current way that we engage with technology so much so that like we, we try and avoid it sometimes. So sometimes you take inspiration from those frustrations and you're like, okay, if I'm really frustrated with the way that we currently engage with technology through the keyboard and through like these experiences that like are not connected to the environment around us, how do I make that better? How do I go from here to looking back out at the world? Um, so I think that's the greatest, on my side at least, the, 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 the biggest inspiration for a lot of the AR, AR work I do is, is comes from a place of frustration. I mean, I'll give you another example. Um, I was born and raised as Muslim and like many Muslims around the world from most of the Muslim majority countries, I don't speak Arabic, which means that I have grown up for 33 years praying in a language I don't understand. Like what a crazy idea alone, right? Imagine praying in a language you don't understand. So when I first got my spectacles, the first AR lens that I developed on Lens Studio was just the ability to see the prayers that I was doing in English and hear it in Arabic so that I could still be praying, but I could actually understand what I was saying. Um, so again, that is like a frustration that I had with my life, with my world, 
and being able to build an AR technology to solve for that frustration. So yeah, frustration is the number one place where I, I personally find uh, inspiration. Uh, Max? Yeah, and I guess, um, let's uh, agree with most of what you said, or everything you said, uh, but maybe a, a different perspective from my uh, side was, in terms of the creativity, uh, two things. One, uh, you know, obviously I love, I love reading, so and and I grew up in uh, uh, in Kenya. That's where I was born and raised. So that natural uh, background and that sort of mythology, I love that. You know, you know that hills were once giants, or, or, or all that is you know something that I, I grew up with, and I, I love that. Um, so I'm constantly sort of trying to, or well, not constantly, you know, reading and and watching. Um, shows tv shows or that's a big creative source for me and the second uh part was you know speaking to actual uh, augmented reality was probably pokemon go i didn't play a lot of it but i'll just give you this one example i i, I lived in vietnam for a couple of years and i had a friend one sunday he said oh you know come and do this thing with me and i was like i didn't even know what it was and i was a bit annoyed i was like well, what are we doing why are we walking around but at the end of that process, it, it, it was just so awesome because it, it took me to, within the place I was living in, in Hanoi, within my suburb, we ended up just exploring little streets. And even though the end uh, product was, was, was related to the game, the journey along that was actually really special. When I look back on it, it, it meant that you, we're just walking around seeing parts of, of, in this case, it wasn't in nature, it was, it was in a, a hustling city, but but just that journey to, to even uh, getting the game was very special. And I, I remember that as, as well. And um, that's partly, I think, interwoven in our games is being, in, you know, there's, there's the, the bonus of the game, but it's also just being in nature, seeing animals. And, and Yusuf and I talk about this, I know it's not related to, to uh, perhaps your question, but one of the challenges for our game design is animals in particular, because you cannot easily predict where animals will be and, and you know, capturing them on an AR lens to activate the game or so on is going to be difficult. But one of the things is, is if you can just make the game that gets people uh, out in nature, you, you end up, because you're there and if you're lucky, you end up seeing animals. Um, and we often see koalas or, or, or really beautiful um, Australian wildlife while we, we're doing that. So, again, that, that just all brews together and, and helps with the creativity, I think. So uh, something I'm getting between the lines here is is there's kind of, you're trying to push towards a world um, where people are a little more out there and, and using technology to engage with the environment. What is the dream here? What does the utopia look like? What do you wish? What are you hoping for in, in 10 years? Is it is it augmented reality brings people more into the world? I'm curious, like, what your hope, your dream is here. I love that question so much. I'll start with kind of the next uh, two or three years, and then I'll extrapolate out to, to the next kind of decade. In the next two or three years, we actually think that like people around the world are infinitely more creative than we are. Um, and they tell amazing stories to their kids when they're walking around natural spaces. And, you know, I'm sure all of us on this call have, have, have lied down on the, on the grass at some point in our lives and looked up at the sky and, and, and made shapes out of the clouds and, and, and told ourselves little stories about what we see there. Um, in the next two to three years, we'd love to develop um, AR authoring tools. We'd love for the global community to be able to con contribute their own uh, stories and characters to navigate their local environments. So, like, I think, you know, somebody that, that is a frequent visitor to Yosemite National Park in, in, in the U.S. or Yellowstone, they'll have amazing stories. And, and, and we've got Albert the koala, but, but I want to meet the, the, uh, the American, you know, bald eagle. And, and I, I want to find out what his name is and what his story is and, and what adventures he might uh, go on or she might go on or they might go on. Um, so I think authoring tools are really exciting in the near term and, and, and empowering a community of um, people that are kind of 
environmental lovers to, to, to share that experience with others, right? We're really about saying, okay, how do we actually bring new users to mother nature? Um, so that's the kind of like two to three years out. I think um, four to five years out, it's about connecting. It's about, I mean, like, like so many lens creators, like so many art developers, we've got to find a way to make this sustainable. We've got to find a way to monetize this. We, as much as possible, want to keep the games free. I think we want to make sure that people can always access and have fun with these games. Um, but like really creating this this um, this uh, kind of sustainable um, what we're calling like Uncle Bob's marketplace, but this sustainable marketplace where the games lead you to um, products and services in your environment. Um, and I think if we do if we do those two things correctly, if we can all the tools that allow us to have really customized games at scale, if we can connect people to local businesses and create revenue streams. Then, as we push seven to eight to nine to ten years out, we get to a space where two things happen. One, the primary input to the games moves from the phone to wearables. Because as I said, it's fun on a phone, but like, I want to be here. I want to see trees come to life and tell me stories like Lord of the Rings, right? I, I, I think that's where the games can get really exciting. But the beauty of de developing on Snap AR is it's not like we have to build experiences for this and experiences for this. The stuff we build on a phone also works on a spectacle. So it's the same tech stack you're, you're, you're building out. Um, but the ultimate goal is, is, is that stuff that I was talking about earlier is, is, okay, once we've got lots of games, lots of users, lots of data, how do we connect these users and their data to farmers who can then say, oh, wow, okay, we've studied the data, we're seeing what, like, natural ecosystems are evolving what types of fruit and vegetables naturally grow well in this space let's start planting those the, the, the game users are actually inspiring the farmers and i'd love i mean we speak about this a lot we would love a future where the games actually allow you to connect to local producers of food um uh, we're so disconnected you know you go to your supermarket and you you you, you buy a, a your honey or your orange, you've got no idea where that came from and what world that came from. Like, uh, we, we've spoken a lot about, and we're already starting to work with some local partners here in Australia. Like, imagine AR games that guide you not just to natural environments, but to lo your local farm. And you end up on a local farm and you get to see them producing honey. And maybe they're like, hey, as part of the game, you've got to put on the honey suit and you've got to go and, and, and harvest your own honey. Like, that's a really, really exciting future. But it's a schlep or it's a lot of work, right? If I had to tell you right now, Rog, hey, Rog, I need you to go out to your local uh, farm and go and get some honey. You'd be like, ah, that sounds, uh, that sounds good, but I'm actually just going to go to the, the, the supermarket or the grocery store down the road. But if I, if I made a game that made it fun and incentivized you to go out there and you engage with your local food source, it's really exciting because at the end of the day, this is the biggest issue that we have. This is the problem. The environmentally friendly options always right now have got a green premium. They're, they're more expensive than the sustainable options, uh, than the non-sustainable options. The, 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 the environmentally um, kind of sustainable beef is twice, three times the price as the beef that is detrimental to the environment. The organic oranges are twice the price as the non-organic oranges. So the question is, Rug, how do you get somebody to, uh, to, 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 to pay more for the environmentally friendly option, right? That's something nobody's really been able to solve for. It's really hard. And the, uh, except for the guys that maybe shop at Whole Foods or whatever, but like, how do you get that? How do you get people to pay more for the thing that, that is good for the planet? The simple answer to that is you have to tell a good story. You have to tell a good story of like, this is why it's worth paying more for this because it's better for the planet. And we can think of no better way to tell a good story than through AR. It's really inspiring to talk to you both because like I feel like so often technology is portrayed as this thing that that disconnects us from our local community and it is all about putting us in some you know overarching you know communication network but what's so awesome about talking to you both is that it makes me feel like technology can actually play a really big role in connecting us to like where we live and, and the close things to us so that's that's really exciting um, I want to ask if you have any sort of tips for creators or any thoughts on that and meanwhile while you're saying that i want to give the audience one last chance no worries if you don't but if you have a question you want to throw into the, the chat we can try to take one or two but uh, i'd love to just hear if you have any advice 
Yeah, Max, you want to go first? Advice? <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I, this is obviously my first uh, attempt, being my background as obviously a, a, a professional, a livestock vet, of doing something like this. Um, the biggest thing I've learned or, or is to kind of stick at it. Uh, I know it's, I don't know, any might not sound very profound, but just having a persistence and having a little bit of flexibility. The truth is that the idea that I, like I have an idea in my head of what this could be, uh, and then Yusuf and I work together and we're really lucky to work with a lot of different, uh, some really um, clever people, but it's having that persistence and having that flexibility that what's in your head uh, does need to change, but but still has that core uh, element or still has that core piece running through it. Um, th those are the two big things that, that I've learned myself is, 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 you know, riding the ups and downs, the quiet periods where nothing might be happening or it seems like, you know, you, know, you get rejected and, and so on. And then also making sure, as I said before, with some of the technical, you know, you, you go and, and, and they realize, okay, is totally not possible with, with the hardware or that's just not going to, you know, that just didn't fly. You, you tested that. Um, so those two things, you know, being persistent and, and being a little bit flexible uh, were big learnings for me. And, and I think uh, that's what I would tell someone else is to, yeah, have bucketfuls of, of those two things. So I uh, appreciate that, Max. I, I think telling stories around the environment is really hard, right? Like the reality is people have got, you know, recycling for fatigue. They don't want to hear about like what they should do with plastic. They've heard the climate change story and it's just depressing and they don't want to hear it. So you've got to approach it in a different way. Um, I was recently at a speech from John Cleese. You know, John Cleese is the, is the age old Monty Python dude. And he was speaking about where creativity comes from. And he said it comes from the ability to allow yourself time and freedom to play, just to play. And when we observe, when Max and I observe like our kids and, and, and young people, young, really young kids, um, if you just watch them from a distance, they give themselves permission to play. They, they allow, kids will be sitting on a beach and they'll allow themselves to dream up an entire world where suddenly a bit of driftwood is a character and suddenly, you know, that little storm drain is a, is a dungeon. They build these whole worlds out. And I think as adults, we've lost that a little bit. We've lost that ability to, to imagine and dream and play with our local environments. And the more we've been able to do that, the more creative the ideas have got. Um, and specifically pertaining to this project or any project that you're working on, I think it's really useful to spend time in the environments uh, that you're dealing with. So we literally have spent weeks and weeks and weeks in forests, in national parks, um, just soaking that experience in and, and dreaming up, wow, that tree looks really funky and that looks really cool. And then trying to dig into the science of understanding why that tree looks funky. Why did the leaves grow in that way? Why is it leaning in that direction? Oh, it's actually because the sun's on that side. So the tree's bending in that way. How do we make a little story about how, how the tree's in love with the sun? And, you know, like, I think give yourself permission to play a little bit more. And in that space, you'll find really creative ideas. Incredible. Guys, this was an amazing conversation. I'm feeling really excited and empowered and more optimistic about where we're going and the kinds of technology that like we can maybe empower. So. I, I just I want to thank uh, you both on on behalf of our entire audience for for everything that you shared today. I think it's it's super helpful and uh, and just makes um, I, it, it's inspiring. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Uh, and really, a lot of really great points here. Um, is is there anything the audience should know about maybe keeping in touch or, or in terms of like uh, you know how to follow this project? I mean, uh, the best place is on Snap. Uh, none of this would be possible without 
snap ar to be honest there is no ecosystem uh there is no le uh, lens developer tools outside of lens studio that that could do what we're trying to do here but the ar is so sophisticated and the experiences are so rich um that snap really is the only place to to to, to, to fully engage with this experience so i mean the best way that to engage with it is to play it um you know the lenses are being circulated on twitter uh, i've just dropped a, a video with uh, some of it in there you can scan the snap codes in the video um, get out in your natural environments, play the games, take some photos of your natural environments and, and, and share those with us. Um, and most importantly, we want to work together. We really, really are trying to build a really big team of, of blends creators and developers and creatives. Uh, so if you're watching this and, and you're like, hey, this is, this is something I want to be a part of, um, get in touch because we would love to work together.